Hello there. Uh, today we're starting a new series called the Love of God series, which was taken and inspired from a very renowned discipleship program called Operation Solid Lives, which was created and developed by Pastor Jerry Durman from the Rock Church in Anaheim, California. And today in this first session that is entitled Love from the Very First Chapter, I would like to talk to you about our wonderful planet, uh, its remarkable inhabitants, and their loving creator. And I would like to start with a, a few interesting uh, scientific facts about our planet Earth and about, uh, uh, about the creation in general. In 2007, Disney Nature released a beautiful new documentary called Earth. And just as the film, film begins, while viewing breathtaking satellite video imagery, the distinct and resounding voice of James Earl Jones begins in his narration with these words. While, while you're looking at our planet, of all the planets in our universe, we know of only one that can support life. It's called Earth. Just the right distance from the sun, it's, perfect, it's a perfect climate, Earth rests at exactly or at an angle of exactly 23.5 degrees to the sun. Without that crucial tilt, everything we know would be different. That's it. That is exactly right. Earth is created so uniquely and placed in our solar system so precisely and even the tilt on its axis makes this perfect atmosphere for what we might call complex life. The animal kingdom, the, the plant kingdom are not sustained on, on any other planet that we found. And today I, I would like to talk exactly about that. And I want you to understand that from the very first chapter of the Bible, we're not only finding a powerful God, an intelligent God, a creative God, but also a very loving God. And in their book uh, named Rare Earth, Why, Com Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe, that's the title of the book, the geologist and paleontologist Peter Ward and University of Washington astronomy professor Donald Browning present strong evidence to suggest that complex life on other planets cannot be common or even likely as the science community has believed. And in the book The Privileged Planet, the astrophysicist Guillermo Gonzalez and J.W. Richards, a senior fellow at the, fellow at the Discovery Institute, affirmed words and Brownlee's assertions, arguing against the common presumption which says that because there are billions of galaxies, then the likelihood of complex life, life on other planets must be high. Gonzalez and Richards, after identifying 20 undisputable factors which are absolutely necessary for a planet to sustain complex life, attached a mathematical probability equation of 10% to each factor, which for the majority of factors was, was a noted overstatement. In other words, the likelihood of any of these factors existing elsewhere is actually much lower than 1 out of 10. The Privileged Planet video documentary based on the factors, based on, the book, based on this book, elaborates on the calculations showing that with the 1 in 10 equations for each of the 20 factors, the mathematical odds that there would be even one planet in the Milky Way galaxy with all the necessary factors to sustain complex life is 1 in 10 at the power of 15. That is 1 in 1 followed by 15 zeros. The point is that because of the numerous and, essentials factor, and essential factors needed, the odds are considered a mathematical impossibility that there could even be one planet like ours, let alone another. And not only does the planet need all 20 factors, but each of the factors must be sustained and with proper ratios and balances respectively. So here's the question. Here's the question. How did all these factors come about for our planet? And how are they uniquely sustained, balancing all the necessary ratios so that we can continue to live as we do? 
And that brings us to Genesis chapter 1, where we'll begin our study. And we will begin with our, uh, this is, will be the first section where we will talk about God, the loving creator, our loving creator. And let's start, let's begin by reading Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I will read from the New King James Version, English Version, but you can read uh, from other versions, but I'll be following this version. Let's read together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice that it's, it, it says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. It doesn't say mom. It doesn't say that someone else created the world. And we, uh, the people today, they are trying so hard to remove God from the creation. And they, they would call the source of the creation, the, uh, the source of the earth and everything that it's, it is in it. They will call it any other way but God. They will call it Mother Nature, Mother Earth, but just not God. They would like to replace God with anything, uh, anything uh, other than God. But everything came into being with intentionality. And that's really important. It didn't just explode into being like we like to believe. And a lot of people like to believe that or evolve in this way. I like the story of a little boy that came home from school. And he goes to his mom and he asks this question. Mom, where did we come from? And mom says, well, God created us. Then the boy goes to his dad and he asks his father. Dad, where did we come from? And dad says, well... We came from monkeys. The boy goes back to his mother and tells him, Mom, Dad says that we came from monkeys. Uh, to which mom responds, Well, I'll tell you about my side of the family and he will tell you about his side of the family. That's a funny joke. But isn't that, isn't that true? Isn't that something that we find all over the place? People that Some people believe in God, that He is the Creator, and other things that other people think that we came from monkeys or evolved in, in, some, in some way. So what I want you to see today is that from the very first chapter of the Bible, we find the Creator God. And He's not just a powerful Creator, an intelligent Creator, a creative Creator, but also a loving Creator, a loving God. And these intended creations were very purposeful and they all point to you and to me. Let's continue our reading in Genesis uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Isn't it interesting to you that our bodies function in, uh, in a way that in every 24 hours we need as people, we need a stretch of time where to sleep and rest, to have a time of sleep. And if we don't get it, you probably notice that we don't function well. We might put up lamps and different lights and we might try to stay late, but nevertheless, in the long term, we become unhealthy We become if we don't rest enough. And, isn't it, and also, isn't it interesting to you that the earth is made up in such a way that we have about half of it in darkness, being in darkness, and about half of it in light? Is that chance or is, it was designed by, uh, that way? Is that, was it intended to be that way or it just ap appeared to be that way? That, these are a few questions that I would like you to think about, uh, and we will think about it together. Let's continue reading, verse 6 to, to 8. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second, were the second day. This is talking here about the atmosphere around the earth. And God created this atmosphere, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% carbon dioxide and other gases so that we can breathe easily. Now, God could have created this atmosphere in such a way that we could survive in it and live, but it wouldn't be like it is today. For example, the makeup of the atmosphere could be in such a way 
that to breathe we'd have to do something like <laughs> we, it would make it so difficult for us to breathe but it isn't that way we breathe so naturally and so and, and we don't struggle to breathe we don't even realize when we breathe it's so normal to us and so naturally that we don't even think about it isn't that right you don't think when you breathe i don't think when i breathe you, we just do it how did that happen was it intended or just exploded um let's continue our reading verses 11 to 12 uh then god said let the earth bring forth grass the the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind and god saw that it was good so god made food and it made it and he made it so plentiful on in all the earth we don't just have plant life on the earth we have food source plants and not just any plants now god could have made just this one vegetable and think of your least favorite vegetable that you can think of that you don't like at all which tastes horrible and god what if god took that vegetable that you don't like and put in it all the nutrients all the minerals all the vitamins and he would come to you and tell you look here it is just eat this for breakfast for lunch and for dinner and that's all that it is it just did vegetable how would that life be how would life be eating just this horrible vegetable that you i don't know which vegetable is for you carrots uh, cauliflower i don't know uh, 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 any other vegetable that you don't like god could have could have done that but he didn't instead we have lots of vegetables a variety of textures and colors and flavors and think about the fruits the apples the bananas the strawberries the kiwis the watermelon whatever fruit you like the peaches is that that your mouth like is like starts drooling when you think of all these fruits and you can go to any you can go to any place where they do these juices with fruits and you can just pick whatever fruits you like i would like mango and uh, strawberries or i would like peaches and oranges and you can pick whatever you like did god why do we need all this we don't we god god didn't have to do all this uh, variety because we don't have to have that but what i'm showing you is that when god created this planet he didn't create a place just for us to survive he created a place for us to thrive and enjoy isn't that a beautiful planet he wanted us to enjoy this planet not just survive in it not just live in it and this all these things didn't just happen by chance notice the details the variety the flavors the 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 colors the scents this is what i'm telling you that from the very first chapter of the bible we find not only a powerful intelligent and creative god but also a loving god his his such a loving god who created this world for us in a special way to make us enjoy it not just survive it he wanted us to enjoy this planet and this is the point that i'm trying to uh, get across to you for this first session that god loves his creation and he uh, he went all his way to such great lengths to create a beautiful planet for us to enjoy let's move on to genesis chapter 1 verse 20 in the same chapter then god said let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens why did god make sea creatures some of us here like fish i like fish some of you might like shrimp lobster i for me i don't in particular like those but a lot of people like shrimps uh, like lobster mahi mahi and you can think uh, to any other kind of fish you don't have to like it but if you like it you can eat it 
And it's not only for food. So many, so many of us, we like fish, but it's, you notice that God didn't create these beautiful creatures just for us to eat them. You can go to an aquarium or you can go to a, to a place where you can see all, you can watch all these animals in the water. Uh, recently, I went with my family, with my wife and my son, Justin, to Gardaland here in Italy. And we went to a big aquarium and we could watch in this big aquarium all these beautiful animals. The, the sea cat, the shark, the dolphin, the, all these little car, all these fi uh, fish with the different colors, orange, uh, blue, uh, the seahorse. It's so beautiful. And you see to all, the, you watch all these forms, all these uh, figures, all these colors, all these different environments, uh, such a diversity. And you enjoy that just watching them. I, we were, I was there with my son and with my wife and we just stayed there and watched this beautiful, uh, uh, this beautiful scenery in front of us in the water. Uh, and God created this fascinating world, sea world, for us to enjoy and to eat a bit, but also to enjoy. I want to say that I, I would like also to say the story when I, I was in the Caribbean with my wife, I had the chance to go in a vacation a work and vacation. It was with my job and we were, uh, we went to um, do the snorkeling thing in the water. I don't know if you had that, ever had the chance to do snorkeling, go underwater with that tube and breathe and see the creatures underwater It's fascinating. But I had the misfortune to step on a sea urchin, like with, with all these um, spikes. And it hurt, it hurt so badly that it took me two months to recover from that, from that creature. I couldn't do anything. It was so painful. But I had to wait for all those spikes to dissolve by themselves in my food. And it was so painful. But it's so... What I want to say is this, it's such a diversity. God created so many things, so beautiful, so diverse for us to enjoy. Let's move on to verse 24, chapter, Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. What is this talking about? It's talking about steak. It, ta it talks about meat. God didn't just make vegetables, but steak too. He made meat. And for those of you who are vegetarians or vegans, I love you. May God bless you. But for all the other people who love meat, who like meat, don't you like from, uh, from uh, uh, once in a while a, a nice grilled piece of steak of, or even pork or sausages on the grill? Mmm, isn't that, isn't God good or is God good? So God created also meat, he created animals uh, uh, so that we would enjoy and we, we would have uh, different food, different flavors to eat. And then God comes to his ultimate creation in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now let's make men, but not like the plants or animals, but in our image and our likeness. From the outside, we look like God. He, not like elephants, not, not like any other animal, this is the way God is, and we were designed after Him. We also have certain capacities that the animal kingdom doesn't have. We have certain characteristics, traits, abilities that are inherent in our design. Think about food. Animals, they crave food, but they cannot enjoy it like we do. They, you, you, will not, you, are, you will not see an animal, you will not see an animal that takes the food in its mouth and then says, mmm, this is good. I've never seen such an animal. But we people, we, we enjoy it. They can enjoy it, but we can enjoy it. Uh, and and that's, that's, so, that's, that's so wonderful that God created us in His image. God not only created this world and went to such great lengths to make it beautiful with all these details, all the colors, all the sounds, the scents, 
but then he created us with the physiological ability to interface with them, with the psychological ability to discern them, and with the emotional ability to enjoy them. Animals don't have that, but we do. Uh, think, about, think now about when you went to a camp or to a vacation, you went into the mountains, you went to the seaside. I'm sure uh, that anyone, every one of us might have seen at least once in their lives a beautiful landscape, a beautiful scenery in the nature. And you said, wow, this is beautiful. I would stay here for all my life just to enjoy this. So, so many colors, green, blue, and they don't, they are not, um, they are not affecting my vision or any, in any way distorting. They are beautiful and we enjoy them. And we, you stay, think about the sound of someone playing the piano. Think of the smell of the coffee in the morning. Uh, to, for those who, uh, of you that love coffee, think about the smelling of a barbecue. Have you ever come home and just smelled in the air the beautiful smell of someone cooking a barbecue? Um, animals don't have that, but we have. We have all these scents of flowers, of roses. Uh, when, we go, when we go and buy some flowers, we can smell them. We can smell different, different perfumes and we can choose. We have so much, so much variety. Uh, uh, See, let's see further on Genesis 2 chapter 2 verse 20 so Adam gave names to all cattle to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field to every beast of the field but for Adam there was not found a helper a helper comparable to him so God replicated himself into man and Adam looked like God, and we look like God. He was walking with God, he talked with God, thought like God, acted like God. And Adam all of a sudden had a desire. Since the Bible says that Adam didn't find a helper in this verse, in verse 20, it means that he searched for one. Isn't that right? Adam went to God and told him that he was alone. I think that happened when he, when God brought in front of him all the animals to give them names. And all of a sudden, Adam realized that I'm alone. I, I need someone. I want someone. There's something I desire, but I don't know what exactly. All the animals came to him to name them, but there was none that resembled with what he was looking for. Then Adam goes to sleep. And when he wake, wakes up, all of a sudden, this new animal appears in front of him. And he says, wow, I like her. I like her. I like this creature. She looks like me. And plus, she's beautiful. She's not just like me. She's beautiful. Uh, and if you read by yourself in Genesis 2.7, the word made when God uh, said that he made man in Hebrew is yatsar. And it means to squeeze, to press, to mold in a certain shape. That, that's the term that God used in Genesis 2.7 to, uh, when he uh, talked about creating man. But then the word used for creating the woman in Genesis 2 verse 22 is bana. And it means designed, fashioned, modeled. And I'm personally glad that he didn't just squeeze women, but he fashioned women. Aren't you glad, man, for that? And when he made us men, he finished very fast. But when he created wo women, he fashioned them. He molded them. He made them beautiful. And God made the, um the woman out of the man. How did God know? This is the question. How did God know what Adam desired? Have you ever asked this question yourselves? How did God know that the only thing that will satisfy Adam's desire will be a bride, will be a woman? I mean, why didn't God give him a car or a remote control for all the things in the world? I mean, we men love control, love remote controls, love cars, love uh, so, many, so many things. But look, look at this. God, God gave him a bride. God gave him a And he knew exactly what Adam wanted or and desired even though he didn't know how did god know he knew because god desires the same thing 
someone to love and to love him back. Someone that he can love and, uh, and be uh, someone that he can love and that person to love him back. His greatest desire is you. He, he desires someone to, with whom to share everything, his life, his power, his love. He created us and you and me with a free will so that we can love him freely. Because uh, only a, per, a free person can really love. You know, you cannot, you cannot bind your wife to a chair and force her or to love you. That's not love. Love happens when a person is free to love, to choose to love. And God wanted us, wanted to create someone that he could love and from, we, from whom he could receive back love. And that's not, that doesn't mean that, that uh, God felt lonely or he was pitying himself and he, out of desperation he thought like, oh well, let's, 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 make, some, let's make someone, let's make someone to, to love us. No, he wasn't desperate. He is self-sufficient. But in the same time, he wanted to give that love and to receive that love back. He, his greatest desire is to love and to be loved. And isn't that interesting that when we look at us who are his creation, we are created in his image, in his likeness, we have the same desire to love and to be loved, to, love, to be loved back, to be appreciated, to be acknowledged, to be respected, to be praised, to be encouraged. That's our most in our innermost desire as humans and for the next few weeks i'm going to we're going to walk together through the bible and i'm going to show you that this same god who created everything around us and you and me so beautifully it is the same god who when things went wrong and we know that when they went wrong he came to restore he came to help and he's the same God who, who says and who tells you, I want to answer your prayer, prayers. I want to heal your body. I want to save your souls. So I want to forgive your sins. I want to restore your relationships. I want to provide for your finances. Let me show you how. God wants to do all these things for you and for me. He loves us so much. Remember what I, uh, the phrase that, uh, with which I began with, God is not only a powerful God, He's not just an intelligent God, He's not just a creative God, but He's also a loving God. And He wants to, to, to share everything that He has, everything that He is, He wants to share with you and me. That's the, that's the God that we have. That's the loving God that we have. And from Genesis to Revelation, there is a cent central story throughout all the Bible. Uh, and the story is the story of God's love for us. Everything else, this is the, this is the whole thing in the Bible. Everything else is peripheral. It's, it's there on the sidelines, watching the central story uh, happening through all the Bible. And here's the story. From the beginning of creation, God loved us and wanted life. Wanted life to be perfect, but something happened. Something went wrong, and we'll look at it in the next sessions, that caused things to go astray. But ever since that happened, God has relentlessly pursued us with His love, and He's trying to get us back on track. He's trying to bring us back, and we'll see that uh, when we go through all the Bible, to bring us back in the place where we can enjoy what He's doing and what He has done. And some of you here right now today, when, while you're listening to this session, you may, you, may feel, you, may, you may feel that you're not worthy of God's love. And that's so prevalent. So many people feel that because that's not necessarily from you, but it's from the devil. You feel unworthy of God's love. You feel like you've already messed things up. You feel like it's too late. You're too far away from God. It's been too long since, uh, since uh, you, you went astray from God. And yet, here He is. Here He is. He's got you here and listening to this session, listening to this, to this teaching. And He's speaking to you right now. He's tagging on His heart. And you can feel that. How God speaks to your heart. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's, like, it's like this same God is telling you today, it's not too late. I love you today just as much as if I love you. It's not too late. 
It's not too far. You're, it's not too late. Open your heart to the love of God and commit yourself to be here in the next weeks, in the next uh, sessions and allow God to explain the depths of his love for you and you will be changed. God loves you. God, God is on your side. And this is the purpose of this teaching series to, to tell you that God is on your side. He's on my, he's on my side. He will always be on our, on our, on our side. Even when things, he created everything perfect, everything beautiful. There was nothing to add or subtract. And in all this, in the midst of all this beauty, man blew it, man destroyed it. Man was deceived and just uh, uh, welcomed sin into, into this creation. But right there, even then, God took the initiative. To, we will see that, that God took the initiative to restore back to its place, to help us, to come. And he could have, he could have just left us there. He could, have, he could have forsaken us. I mean, he had heaven. He could, made, he could have made another creation. Might as well. Just start all over. But he didn't. He just decided right there to come and help us because he loves us. And he went to all, all his way to show us. And he's still showing us today how much he loves us. Until we meet again to the next session, may God bless you and uh, teach you and uh, fill you with his love, with his mercy. May, may he help you uh, become more aware of his goodness. He's a good father. He's a good God. He's a loving God. He's not just a powerful God. He's not just an intelligent God. He's not just a creative God. But He's a loving God. Amen.